Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And we're back. How you doing, Doro? I'm doing great. Looking forward to another one. How's your week been? It's been busy. I've been, you know, trying to catch up with a lot of stuff, just personal stuff mostly, but I'm also trying to figure out sound systems for my uh, my setup here. And yeah, just tr- staying busy, but uh, yeah, I need to calm down a little bit. Oh, there's a great quote that I came up with um, that I found actually by a, a wonderful woman. She's a a Buddhist nun, and she, she's, uh, she said, there's nothing worse than to have a running leakage of spirit consciousness. <laughs> and I, I thought that caught, that just captures everything. You know, everybody glued to their flat screens, just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And that's, that's sort of what I envisioned as her <laughs> running leakage of spirit consciousness. So, yeah. I'm keeping First. that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, th- did you say uh, you started a new podcast? I did. And this one is called In Quest. It's primarily um, going to be interviewing. And I've just started. I haven't even posted my first one yet. I've already done one, but I haven't. Po- I'm going to post uh, on a regular basis, hopefully, uh, after I get three or four up. So that is going to be uh, me interviewing um, spiritual slash meditation teachers and, you know, bringing to the bringing to the show anything, the, uh, topping it off with three basic questions that they want to uh, focus on. So it, it's the first one turned out great and I look forward to some more. So it's called the Inquest podcast. Right. Thanks. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, we'll see. How's your week been, Matt? Good, good. Uh, One thing that uh, happened for me this week is Daniel Sheehan's uh, New Paradigm Institute had their uh, first uh, class for the course they're offering in, I think they're calling it Extraterrestrial Studies. And uh, yeah, so I I signed up for their first course. He's teaching the first, um, the first two courses which each is like uh four classes over one class a week for four weeks and then uh, richard dolan is teaching the second two courses with the same format and it's uh so we had the first class yesterday there were i don't know there i think there was over 100 people i think in the live class but i had he said like over he said something like thousands will be watching the video so i don't know if they have thousands already set up for this first course Oh boy. But is it was fascinating. It? Is he is he is that is he talking about thousands within the class uh who's signed up or is this going to be offered on YouTube yeah. or something? No, I I think this is only if you're if you pay to take the course because this is a this is a college credit through Ubiquity University. It's part of building up to get a master's or a PhD in extraterrestrial studies. And oh, that's the yeah. first of its kind. Yeah. That's and great. um yeah i took all sorts of notes because i was i was like you know just like so much information and they they went over the whole outline of the um of his history and what the course is going to cover and oh uh, it's so we're I, talking about daniel sheehan's history well yeah it was first he gave his background and then he started to cover the, what the course is going to cover, which is the entire, basically the history of everything related to ufology for the last 
since like 1933. He said they're not going to go to ancient times. That's going to be a separate whole course. But this is going to focus on the modern era uh, from 1933 to present day involving everything that's happened with UFO sightings, abductions, uh, the cover-ups, Project Blue Book, Project Grudge, the Condon Report, um, Majestic 12, uh, remote viewing. I mean, I, I was like, I, I was like, are you going to talk about telepathy and remote viewing? And yep, yeah, absolutely. She went to oh, good. <laughs> yes. so many abduction stories have, re have telepathy in them. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and remote viewing has been studied. He, he talked all about the Stanford uh, doing this incredible study on remote viewing, the Stanford Research Institute. He told a horrible, oh man, a horrible story I had never heard before. Um, about the the government, or maybe it was the Stanford. No, I think it was a government program because they used nuclear submarines in order to test to see if telepathy mm -hmm. was possible. They were trying to use telepathy or remote viewing as a means of communication with submarines, and so they did a horrible test with a a baby mother rabbit and her babies. Sorry, a mother rabbit and her babies. Yeah. And she put the one of her each of her babies onto nuclear submarines, sent one the submarine one of the submarines under like the Arctic ice, and had the mother like back at you know uh, military headquarters in Washington. And then they killed the baby, and they had they had all these monitors set on the mother to, to just measure every single like physical reaction she had at the exact moment of the baby's death because they had it time they knew exactly when they were oh, going to kill the baby God. rabbit oh, that's and crazy. yeah but not only did they get a physical reaction, i mean the mother went crazy like like just like started jumping all right it was like so it was she absolutely knew. proof of a remote telepathic connection between a mother rabbit and a the baby bunny yeah and that was just one piece that he said that you know that they he just so he talked a little bit about remote viewing totally he said uh mentioned Hal Putoff who was a big you know remote viewing person Lou Elizondo we know has a history with remote viewing even though we won't talk about it and uh you know anyway so I was worried he was going to stay away from telepathy and remote viewing because that's like one of the most interesting areas but nope it's going to be Good. part of this whole thing we're going to be studying he gave us books to read is he going to give you training and how to do it no, it's this is more he wants people there to become experts in all the facts because he's trying to basically train an army of people that are well educated in the truth about humanity's relationship with these non-human intelligences because you know he's like we have to figure out what our policies are going to be how are we going to interact with these groups and we need people you know we're going to need new people to run for congress you know, to because we're going to have to get rid of so many because they're so corrupt and they're uneducated people. We need a whole people with a whole new framework of how to think about where what humans humanity's place in the cosmos is. Oh, I'm so glad that they're working on that answer because, yeah, that's a big one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the one of the. Um, let me see the. Uh, yeah, I think the third course is all about the philosophical and metaphysical implications of this whole thing um first one is all about uh history oh the, but the next one is oh the, the second course is all about every theory like every theory of what is the nature of nhi um whether they're and he says there's like five named five to six uh major theories and let me see et's is one extra dimensional or interdimensional is one extra temporal some sort of time travelers, perhaps us from the future is the third. A breakaway civilization is the fourth. Something like the Atlanteans or our lost human civilization. Uh, the fifth is an AI from another star system or, you know, just an AI of some sort, the Borg, an AI controlling all this. Um, He named a six, which was Carl Jung's uh, theory of this NHI is an unconscious projection of our inner world into material reality. <laughs> I haven't um, heard that one. Makes um, sense. Yeah, that, that yeah. would be very Carl Jung. That that makes sense to me, actually. Yeah. You know, yeah, they all make sense to me. Maybe it's all of the above. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and well, and the seventh is ultra secret U.S. military tech, which is really absurd when you see how far back in time that these things have gone. But yeah. um, <laughs> but it he even mentioned you know Stephen Greer you know who says most of the sightings we see are you know U.S. military secret craft. So I mean there is whether or not they got it from uh, ETs of some sort. You know, I just was watching a YouTube video. I think it was Natural History or some major channel that are they're putting it out there as, you know, all of these UFOs are a threat, and I'm I'm concerned about that. I mean, you know, if a, if a pilot runs into one, yeah, that's a problem. But they're kind of coloring it as you know a, a real threat, and we're going to have to figure out how to manage this. And I don't know. Um, that's going what is your direction. Hmm? what is your feeling i mean you you uh what do you think is going on with the nhis the uh, non-human intelligence do you think they're a threat do you think they're in more than one group i think there's yes definitely i would say more than one group i think that there is a, a species that uh, there's multiple species that are specializing in different things and you know each species has its own sort of piece of the puzzle playing here. I think some are more genetically, uh, you know, focused. Um, some are more uh, conscious focused. Some are dream focused. Um, so I don't know. That's that's kind of my feeling. Is that you know? And if we are scared and frightened, then there's going to be those that are feeding off of that. Um, so I think what we're, what we need to do is decide not what to do or what to say, but how we can be, how we can manage our energy. Um, we have to choose our energy intentionally and consciously. If we fall into fear, you know, we're just going to be catering to that level of, of entity that I think is here. And if we rise higher than that and, you know, meditate, we can um, gain some assistance, I think, from higher dimensions. So that's my, that's the way I break it down. Hmm. How about you? Well, um, well, you know, I've been, I've been really, I've been watching all the Farsight remote viewing videos as my new, like, fascinating narrative to explore and, the um, I mean, I I definitely believe these UFOs, these flying saucers that operate in a way that beyond the physics and technology that mainstream humanity is aware of. I, I definitely believe these things are real, and they've been around Earth a long time. So there's there's something that's been going on a long time yeah. on hum on Earth, and these non humans, this high technology group or groups, they have to. You know, I mean, best case scenario is they have been hands off and just watching humanity for thousands of years. But it seems more likely since there's so many stories of contact with them and there is seems to be a lot of evidence. They've been heavily involved at every step of the way with uh, with humans and human governments and wars. It, it seems like. I mean, as an activist, I've believed and sense that the U.S. democracy and governments have been controlled by corporations. You know, I've, I've always just put it to human corporations are at the top and money is at the top and these closed boys clubs are controlling the world secretly and buying off politicians and lobbying. But now I, it seems, especially because of the, how long this has been going, how coordinated the effort has been going on for for decades and decades and decades, way longer than individual humans can sort of plan out. It just makes more sense that it is one of these NHI civilizations uh, is at the top, the top of the chain of the corruption and control of human corporations and institutions and manipulating things. Oh, I agree. Yeah, yeah definitely agree. Yeah, um, so that's... But, there, but there's also the other influence that's coming in, which is much more spiritual, psychic, um, kind of ready to to help anybody who's who's um, reaching, you know. Yeah. It's, 
D does they talk about that? That there's um, and these I think are more interdimensional. I don't know that they are. They may use ebens or whatever they call ray, grays to to do their in between work, but I think the real higher consciousness ones are interdimensional. That's my feeling. Well, I think you know. I think you know. Um, Farsight and Courtney Brown, they simplify it to, they just say there are malevolent ETs and there are good ETs. And Farsight mm -hmm. claims to communicate with the, and work with the benevolent ones. And they are interested in helping, you know, humanity be free and be prosperous. Um, they all, but they also indicate when they remote view and, and talk to these ETs and ask them about their civilization, it doesn't in, it doesn't look to me like their civilizations i don't get the impression that they're utopian perfect civilizations oh. they but they do seem in favor of humanity not being dominated and enslaved and abused by the malevolent ets which they say has been going on a long time yeah and so mm -hmm. it, it was it's been you know that's the picture i'm getting now is that I mean, you know, just like with humanity, if you just look at all humans, some humans are enlightened. Some humans are, you know, spiritually, they are trying to find a path for happiness for themselves and happiness for the world and equality. And they don't want anyone or any being to suffer or be dominated. Um, I mean, that that spirit, I think, is, of course, alive in non-human civilizations as it is in humans, even if. The, even if the bad ETs, as Farsight says, maybe they're rep, maybe they're mostly reptilian or or these Orions, these sort of like space Nazis that they yeah. Even, but you know, it's just just because they, a one civilization is dominated by a culture or a political system that is really gross, it doesn't mean that that whole species is gross. There's every species, every group is going to have some percentage that is really trying to be good and trying to find a path in life that is beautiful and caring and wants to live in a path of, of love of other species and, and i uh, love, I love what uh, was it courtney brown i guess it was that um sort of outlined this this rationale for what you're saying is that you know you can't have a small group of disconnected powerful people making decisions for all of us so yeah um yeah totally yeah what so what what was recommended what should people do to free themselves from this slavery if you want to call it that yeah well the um we didn't get really get to that in the uh, the course yesterday we just uh he just said this is you know we got to change our thinking we have to shift our whole worldview of we need to shift our worldview completely to we are not alone and to understand we are probably not the apex civilization. We are probably in the lower 1% of powerful civilizations in our own galaxy, in our own solar system. And so, and we have to figure out how to uh, have a relationship with these non-human civilizations. We need to um, see if there's any treaties that are in place. And if there are, we need to renegotiate them out in the open. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and it, it kind of overlaps with, uh, you know, you know, it's going to for me, it overlaps with Courtney Brown, you know, because he talks in a similar vein, but he talks much more explicitly that there are agreements, there are treaties, and he says they're invalid, they were made in secret, and therefore they do not represent humanity, you can't make a secret agreement that represents people. Um, and, um yeah, we need to, he says, the problem is that the the good ETs, they are powerful, but if apparently there is an agreement between, there's like a cold war going on between the good ETs and the malevolent ETs that are, that dominate earth and are behind the scenes on earth. And I think part of that agreement is that they won't reveal themselves to humanity. And Ever? if, if the, well, that's what the malevolent ETs prefer. Yeah. But um, or maybe it's not even an agreement. It's just sort of the status. It, it, if they if the good ETs revealed themselves, then it would be considered it would just escalate to a hot war between the the malevolent and the good. And they're not interested in that. It's sort of like we're in the we're the babies in the field between Russia and the U.S., except it's 
two massively powerful um, NHIs. And so it's kind of, and so they're like, he says that the, the friendlier ETs, um, if they revealed themselves, like they just had a ship appear, then the, well, what happens when they do appear is the humans shoot them down. That's what the mm -hmm. crash retrieval program is. And they don't fire back because then they would seem hostile and it would, because the malevolent ETs want humanity to see the good ETs as invaders. And they want us to be, you know, feel like we have to fight them. And so if so the good ETs don't ever fire back, they just have to let themselves get shot yeah. down when that happens. Wow. Um, and yeah, if they so reveal them, in fact, we're trying to start a, a, a war with them or something. It sounds like. Yeah, I think that's, I think the malevolent ETs, the war is, they are totally good with war. They want war to happen. They want massive human war. They'd probably be okay with significant nuclear war. These are the bad guys, I assume. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think they, they're like fine because war makes it easier to control humanity. You know, the more violence and war, the more we're in our, our reptilian brain and our yeah. live in fear. And it's easier to control and implement authoritarian decisions and just channel money wherever you want you know and when we're at war with iraq or you or ukraine or things are just heating up or right after 9 11 it's so easy to just like send hundreds of billions of dollars to whatever you know the cia and the military industrial complex wants and to go into whatever secret parts and secret programs and groups of humans and probably to the nhis yeah oh create a problem and present the solution that's <laughs> Yeah, that's the old uh, name of the game, right? Yeah. Oh boy. So, so how long was the class? About an hour. Even? Hour and a half. Hour and a half. Yeah, and um, and there was some. Let me just share a couple stories I got from yeah. it. So, first of all, President Carter was in 1976. He, when he was elected, he had seen a UFO, so he knew something was up. So he demanded a briefing from the CIA to explain what was going on with UFOs. The head of the CIA was George H.W. Bush. And he refused to tell Carter anything. So Carter decided to ask the science and technology uh, part of the House of Representatives to work with the Library of Congress to do an investigation and to get Carter all the info they could about UFOs. And they hired Daniel Sheehan at that time, who was a working for the Jesuits as a lawyer, helping them draft public policy. So that is when Daniel Sheehan, as a lawyer, first got engaged in this topic big time. And that was by President Carter in 1976. So he's been involved for a long time. Mm. He then um, got access to all the classified materials from Project Blue Book. And even though Project Blue Book was a massive cover-up, they did have access to a mass amount of materials because they were given all the cases and all the documents. And so Daniel Sheehan got to see the photographs of a crash retrieval uh, flying saucer. And he even saw on the dome of one of these flying saucers writing symbols that he had never seen before, and he wrote them down. Then he went through, because he was like, I wonder what these symbols are. Is anyone going to recognize these as any sort of human language? So um, he took the symbols to the Vatican because he was in the Jesuit order and connected there. And he brought them to a priest or a bishop that he knew at the Vatican and showed, explained the whole thing and showed the symbols to him just to ask, do you, have you ever seen these before? Do these look like anything? And the priest reached into his drawer and pulled out a photograph of a flying saucer. Oh my. Yeah. And the, the, this photograph had been given to the priest by uh, a series of hands. It was actually given to the priest by the priest's sister who got it from her husband, who got it from a pilot who took it and it was over the Seattle area. And the pilot and the uh, guy he gave it to, they didn't want to show it themselves because it would, you know, it has a way of r ruining your pilot, your career oh, if shit. you uh, talk about your How UFOs. long anyway, ago was this? Did, did you remember? This was, nine, well, this is 1976 that Carter okay. uh, got Daniel Sheehan involved. And the pen and the uh, the Pope. Um, what was the Vatican? Happened? It must have been shortly after that that he yeah. had this interaction with the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So I mean that was that was one story, and then I'll just I'll just run through this briefly. So then there's a guy named uh, Mac 
who's a very uh, Dr. Mack. He was from Harvard. I, I don't know what his, I can't know what his first name is. Um, he did, he wrote, he did a bunch of interviews of abductees. Um, and cause he just found these stories fascinating and they used, um, not hypnosis, but, uh, hol holotropic breathing or something to help people relax and remember their abduction stories. But so this guy, Dr. Mack at Harvard, he did all this research, interviewing all these people that had alien experiences, compiled a paper and tried to get it published, I think, in the New England Journal of Medicine. They refused to publish it. So mm -hmm. Dr. Mack just publishes it on his own as a book. And I've got to read this book. Yeah. <laughs> but then the Harvard, all the faculty at Harvard tried to uh, throw Dr. Mack. They brought him up on charges in Harvard for talking about UFOs and aliens. How can they do that? Yeah. Well, so then... Dr. Mack hired Daniel Sheehan to come and defend him in front of the Harvard board. And Sheehan, and then and this is crazy. Sheehan, uh, apparently they knew one of the Rockefellers and the Rockefeller agreed to fund the a, uh, a series of grand rounds classes at Harvard for all the Harvard faculty to show the evidence that non-human intelligence exists and that these UFOs exist. And some of these crashes are real. And the Harvard faculty went crazy when he suggested that. And they dropped the whole suit. And they, they were like, we have no interest. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> yeah. So that's another time that Daniel, she that's how Daniel got massively connected to the ufology community and people like uh, Stanton Friedman and all sorts. He named a bunch of names that I don't even know. Mm. Um, so that was one. of, And now he's, you know, he's the lawyer for Lou Elizondo. So I wonder, does Harvard still have a problem with believing in, in UFOs? Well, you know, Avi Loeb is at Harvard right now, and he's doing the Galileo Project. And they did criticize him, but they are letting him proceed. But it it seems Harvard, you know, seems to be one of the secret society, you know, power beds, mm -hmm. you know, all the way through history. Which it just makes sense. You know, if there's going to be a secret group of humans controlling the world, you're going to use certain schools, certain institutions to be your homes. And it, you know, it looks like all the way back to the founding of this country, Harvard yeah. has been one of them. Yeah. But, oh man, the guy, the guy was just saying story after story. Um, let me see. How many yeah, classes all together? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. No, what were you saying? How many classes are there in this course? There's four. This one is going to have four classes, and but there's four courses total that they have. Um, okay. That you each one you have to pay for. Yeah. And and you know the thing is, and I think after you finish all four courses, then you have the opportunity, I think, to write a master's thesis or I guess go for a a, a doctorate, and they can you know, and if you can write a compelling you know, 30 page master's thesis that um, adds something research, you know, you pick, you can pick any sort of topic to go into and try to develop new knowledge and new information, new research, um, you know, you could get a master's so, degree in extraterrestrial studies. And then can you imagine, so as you're, as you're studying, I'm sure you've got your ears open for some topic or, or sideline that you could develop as a thesis, right? Oh yeah. I'm just like, and, you know, he was like, I mean, it could be as simple as just picking any of these major events and just digging deeper into it and really finding out more. I mean, I like, um, yeah, I've got ideas. I mean, Majestic 12, he mentioned mm. how it was created by Truman to help hide um, what's been going on. So the whole history of that, the, you know, who's been murdered um, over the years, possibly assassinations. Um, I don't think he mentioned that specifically, but it's definitely an area that it seems that this secret keeper group was, was involved with the JFK and RFK assassination. There's definitely oh a threat goodness. there. Can you imagine doing a thesis on, on the MJ 12? <laughs> You're kind of putting yourself in the firing line there. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I'm, I mean, that also just, I'm more interested in the telepathy remote viewing fringe. I mean, that's why we have this show. Cause I mean, he didn't talk about, he did talk about, you know, we're going to get into psychological, philosophical implications, but what could be more psychologically impactful than the revelation telepathy is real 
and your own mind could be potentially snooped on. Could be an you, open book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what would be more psychologically terrifying to people than that? That's like, you know, I think it's yeah. people can't even, uh, you know, that's why they can't even really think about it. That's interesting. I would yeah. want if we did a survey on, uh, you know, a thousand people and asked them on a on a scale from one to 10, one being totally paranoid, couldn't handle it. And the 10 would be that would be fine. They can probe my brain anytime. I don't care. Yeah. I, where would you fall between one and 10? <laughs> oh, well, whether they can probe my brain anytime? Yeah. <laughs> I would. I don't you know, I I don't give permission to go into my mind at all. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, I think that's a good point to make is that, you know, they can probably do it if you're not setting up some kind of a bubble or protection or saying just don't. Um, I mean, I think I, I, that would be important. I don't know. What do you think? I think there might be a law against it. I really, I think, you know, I think these alien civilizations are a law-based group they're guided by treaties and laws and i get the sense even with a lot of these abduction stories you hear if you clearly say no then they have to not take you i think that their trick is they can get people to say yes the same way you know sometimes it might be a tricky you know they make it seem like you don't have a choice like maybe they threaten you verbally, but they, I think they can't actually physically take you against your will. If you consent because, you know, you believed one of their threats and their threat could be like, not like, we're going to hurt you if you don't go, but you're going to die if you don't go. Cause you need us to cure you, or they could just lie to you about something, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, manipulation, you know, gaslighting there's no there's no law against lying and gaslighting. <laughs> there's not, oh, there's, I don't think there's a law against that, but I think there's a law against actual violation of people's um, uh, consent. Yeah. And so, uh, so, and so I think the same thing with your brain. I think my theory is that's why the, the Lord's prayer in the Catholic church says, um, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's like, it's a way to every day make people say, okay, if someone did violate my brain, I forgive them. So they're like immediately absolving all <laughs> trespassing okay. that any NHI is doing. That's an easy pass. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear. It's like, you know, they're like, they can defend that. They, this is the way legalistic bureaucrats are. They need legal defenses. And so it's like, yeah. And, and 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 what if like you know they're named you know they're they're somehow they're um when you invite Jesus in maybe Jesus is the name of the NHI telepathic entity in some way and so it's like they've invited Jesus in I mean it's like yeah. you're inviting it in I I think that th that this whole idea of law and you know they they can lie and everything and cheat but they can't break the law i think that probably would be more prevalent on the lower sort of reptilian levels i think higher consciousness is more geared toward ethics and morality and the um you know th that they almost don't need written law that they that they actually live by more uh, ethical behavior that's my well, sense they well, I mean, different groups might have different laws. So some yeah. of the more enlightened ones might have laws against deception and lying. So they, yeah. um, but it, uh, yeah, I, uh, this is going to be good. I'm going to enjoy following you taking this class. This is bringing up some good stuff. Yeah. Plus I'm excited to sort of connect with this whole community of people that are studying this. Um, and, uh, could draw from that possibly for people to be involved here or to into the, the equal voice vortex that I'm building. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we want to, uh, for this podcast, um, perhaps start bringing in some people to, to interview. Is that part of the plan? Well, for, as for we mentioned last week, uh, trying to get Yeme, uh, the, one of their remote viewers to come on the show. And I think I'm going to, she said she was available next week. So I'll like, see if we can get her on to have our first interview uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. 
next week yeah. with a remote viewer. Maybe we'll make that a thing. Wouldn't that be fun to have remote yeah. viewers on and do a little session once in a yeah. while? Speaking of Farsight Institute, there is they released a um a video on YouTube, their uh Farsight March uh update. And this one is pretty I mean, they're really sticking their neck out with this one. They're uh -oh. they're saying they did a remote viewing to try to see because they're like, you know, it looks like the Biden and Trump campaigns look so weak and, you know, they're incredibly bad candidates. And they and and Courtney Brown was just fascinated by how aggressive the attacks have been on RFK Jr. Yeah. And he was just like fascinated. It looked like the mainstream media was like re-editing his clips to, to they're just like pulling out all the stops mm. to try to slow him down. And so they did a remote viewing <clears throat> to take a look at who were the biggest, most uh, strong opposition forces trying to stop RFK Jr. And he says that they uncovered a serious assassination plot. Oh and uh, yeah, he yeah. says that. So they're releasing in two weeks the uh, the details of their remote viewing sessions. He says that he believes that by releasing this info, it will it will prevent this assassination attempt. But he, they're gonna they're going to release all this the remote viewing info on it, and it's uh it's really disturbing. Um, yeah. But we'll you know, and he says they did it before. They did this in 1997. They did a remote viewing that saw a nuclear uh, someone who's going to take a suitcase nuclear bomb into New York City, and they released their Farsight remote viewing on it. And uh, then, if and if you look back, and um, you'll see there there is evidence now looking back of uh, two I think Lithuanian or Ukrainian guys trying to smuggle in nuclear suitcase bombs into Miami who got caught like uh, shortly after that. Um, yeah, I mean, the military uses remote viewers, right? I mean, they, they, they it's a real thing. And so that would make sense that, you know, if something legitimate comes up through a remote viewing, that they would try and stop it. Well, yeah, I mean, if the, you know, it, if there is a part of the military and CIA that is working on the side of good, it seems, uh, it's like it's like it seems fractured. It seems part of the intelligence community is on the side of like Lou Elizondo, David Grush, Christopher Mellon, and part is just on the side of Lockheed Martin and mm -hmm. Adiant. And, and actually, I have a, a a short clip to play um, oh, of the latest news, um, sort of along these lines. Let's yeah, I am concerned about um, you know RFK. He's he's been he's had break-ins and and yet. He can't uh, he can't get any bodyguards or coverage like the other candidates. Yeah, well, that's what that's what Courtney Brown says. It's like it's suspicious. They're not allowing him CIA protection or right. not CIA uh, Secret yeah. Service protection. Yeah. Um, they're just leaving it wide open. Um, yeah. OK, so here's a this clip is from Post Disclosure World. This guy has been covering disclosure forever and I uh, really like him. And here he's talking about how it's it's come out that uh, Travis Taylor, who is uh, connected with Skinwalker Ranch, was um, part of uh, the people blocking the part of the U UAP Disclosure Act. Um, but there's some interesting details here that comes out. So I'll just play the What's his clip. name again, this guy? Uh, his site is called Post Disclosure World. Oh, I don't know what his actual name is. Okay. Um, his uh, YouTube channel is Post Disclosure World. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Now, on December 3rd, Liberation Times covered this story that Sheehan was discussing just now in an article titled, Daniel Sheehan exposes five powerful Republicans blocking UFO Disclosure Act as the clock ticks down. And I'm going to share two pertinent um, citations from Christopher Sharp's article asked to specifically name the entities pressuring representatives Turner and Rogers. Sheehan pinpointed Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, 
Radiance Technologies and the CIA's Directorate of Operations, run by David Marlowe, its current deputy director. While the Liberation Times has been un unable to further substantiate the involvement of these organi organizations, Sheehan states, the two chairpersons have been gotten to by the private aerospace industry and by the CIA. Who knows what positive offers they've been made for additional campaign contributions or what kind of threats have been made to them. The CIA's covert operations people are capable of delivering. Here's another citation. Sources indicate to Liberation Times that the CIA's Office of Global Access, OGA, works closely with the Directorate of Operations in conducting retrieval missions involving crashed or landed crafts of non-human origin. Sheehan added, the operations directorate is the dog that wags the tail in the CIA. According to Sheehan, the CIA is responsible for dispersing non-human materials to aerospace companies, and he says Radiance Technologies is one of its newest customers. Quote, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and now Radiance Technologies are given particular discrete aspects of the technology to try to figure it out. Sheehan said that the three contractors could potentially be subject to lawsuits due to the alleged arrangements with the CIA, commenting, quote, it makes those particular companies subject to massive antitrust lawsuits by other companies that are trying to be honest and trying to compete against them. So with regards to the two excerpts I just shared with you, bear in mind that scientist Travis Taylor, Taylor works for Radiance Technology. So I'm going to pause it there. I just wanted to. Oh dear. I mean, this is, this is big. I, it's just everywhere now. The FDA, all this corporate capture is a, is a, we're completely off track as a world. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and it's like corporate capture, but it, it's way more disturbing to me to, if the corporate capture ends at aliens <laughs> it's just like <laughs> and it's i mean it, even if it's there's it's the ends at some group of of uh some small group of sort of small-minded aliens it's yeah. just uh it's that's that's way more disturbing than it just ending with a bunch of rich guys you know rich selfish humans yeah um, yes I, but i do feel that that we are being tested it's like if we don't stand up to declare our own sovereignty they're just my deep feeling is that they're we're being tested you know how much are they going to want to control us and are we going to let them control us i and i don't know that this is supposed to come down to a big war or a battle i think it's just how how much can we let go of fear because that's their driving tool that's their method you know controlling everything through fear and threat and and uh, how do you how do you overcome the fear of being threatened? Yeah, <laughs> big one. Yeah, it's a it. Well, also, I, I think I mentioned this to you when we spoke earlier this week. There is if if the if Farsight's remote viewing of the way alien species are outside of our solar system, all the ones out in the galaxy, it sounds like they're just a big complicated network of basically corporations and some might be structured in a more enlightened way than others and some are more just authoritarian um because they they have this uh they have on their site they have a, a project called uh the asani resistance movement or something um yeah the, the Asa uh, it's s asani resistance movement where they had Apparently they had heard there is a group of aliens that is organized and trying to and in favor of freedom for all beings. And they're uh, resisting some of the authoritarian aspects of some of the different groups out there. And so they tried to do this remote viewing communication with people involved with this and leaders of in the Asani movement. And they got a variety of very interesting telepathic conversations in this uh, video that they posted. I you, you get a kick out of it because two of them had a conversation with a mantis alien. Um, oh, oh, that's up my alley. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, but you definitely get the sense from they try to ask, they asked every alien that they spoke to, are is your species a slave race to another? 
And the answers were always kind of complicated. And some said yes. Some said uh, not from our perspective, but you might kind of see it that way. And another sort of said it's complicated. It's like a, and, and kind of painted a picture of a network of organizations connected in all sorts of different ways with different levels of power over others. And in the, the remote viewer said it's the best analogy he could come up with was corporations that it seemed it was like, it was like corporations. And um, so anyways, it's like when I got that picture and, and so it's in some of them, they were like, they weren't upset. They, they kind of asked them, are you trying to free yourself from whatever level of, enslavement you are and some of them said yes some of them said no <laughs> and it was and so uh it, it just made me realize that we on earth even though we're in the middle of this mess of a powerful non-human intelligence being a human on earth might be one of the most free uh positions you can be on in the universe and that's, that's kind so of interesting, interesting. You know, the whole idea of slavery is a, is a hard one because, I mean, take, for example, a, um, you know, l let's look at a trucker, right? Somebody who drives across the country and let's say he loves his job and he gets to see the world and go every place. And um, is that slavery? You know, I don't, he's working for m massive corporations or what have you, but he does it with, um, with pleasure is that slavery it's not yeah. it's not slavery if you can if your job is optional if your job is a job you cannot quit um it's not slavery but you can be abused by that power structure and you're trapped now that of course being trapped it might be you know that's kind of the nature of life you might be trapping yourself you're making yourself you know feel oppressed because you are believing you cannot quit because you don't want to lose the job. You don't want to lose the income. You don't want to have to start over. Um, but if, uh, but if you can't even quit, there is no option to quit or quitting basically means you have to become homeless or, I mean, I, if you, if, if quitting means you die, then it's, I'd say that definitely it's qualifies as slavery. <laughs> <You know? laughs> If I quitting means so. you get imprisoned, it's definitely going to be, or beaten. If yeah. if uh, if your boss is allowed to beat you physically. I agree. I say that's slavery. If yeah. they're allowed to emotionally abuse you and they know you are, you are trapped and they know they can emotionally abuse you. I, I still, I say that's on the realm of, that's on the, the spectrum of slavery. Yeah, I, I would say that's slavery. Um, being abused. I think is is slavery. But I think, you know, as I mentioned, I think I told you the other day in uh, Hinduism, they have that class system. I don't know if they have it so much anymore, but it used to be that if you were born into a, a, a situation where you had to be a street sweeper, then your whole life was supposed to be, maybe still is, about how to do that perfectly and with you know, attention and mindfulness and bring beauty to it, you know, try to make it lovely, even as a, tr a street sweeper. So you just take what's given to you and then you do the best you can. But I don't think abuse was part of that picture. I think abuse is a big part of that um, slavery piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Taking advantage. Well, yeah. Well, I think I could so easily see it being tied to your spaceship. I mean, if if it seemed like a lot of these aliens they were talking to were on giant motherships of some sort, and if you're on a, let's say you're living on an aircraft carrier or a giant boat, and they're like, well, you either have to do some work on this boat as be part of the crew, or we are going to drop you off on an, <laughs> we're going to kick you off. I mean, deserted island, yeah. So like, if you're on a spaceship and that's your home, and you don't have a planet that you can go to to live on, that's comfortable or then you are trapped and you have to like take a job and they're gonna like these are the they might be like you can there's two jobs you can have on this ship and those are the only ones you're qualified for and it is and and, and if you have and if your brain is not private i mean if they can get into your brain without your consent and manipulate what you see and feel 
Um, well, I mean, again, that's, that's, I think, in the realm of slavery, but um, I agree. I think that kind of abuse, but you know, if you were on a spaceship under those same conditions where you were constantly being reminded of how valuable you were and how, you know, being respected and appreciated and supported to the point where you're feeling um, like this is wonderful. And that's, I don't think slavery. So really, I think it's what's coming down from the top. Is it, is it force? Is it manipulation? Is it, uh, you know, taking advantage? Um, that would be slavery. Yeah. Well, I think you have to have choice. I mean, as long yeah. if, I mean, I could see myself being happy living on an amazing spaceship. If they were like every day, we need you to do four hours of work and we will give you options of the different jobs and you can learn new skills if you want to try to like do different jobs that are more interesting to you as long as there's like options for personal growth and happiness and the and but you know if it's four hours a day that's what i think is like reasonable in a 24 hour day but if they're like 12 hours a day of work i'd be like no i'm right. not, not interested exactly i mean, i would be like eight hours i'd be like i'm not interested i'd rather drop me on earth i will make my way <laughs> on earth i'll figure it out Leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's big yeah so i do think it's all about um our our the energy around us how it's manipulating us or controlling us um or influencing us let's put it that way yeah. it's just going to influence us and and then we have to find the best way of managing um Anything else about your class? This is uh, this has been a good one. No, it just uh, it just seems like it's a great academic intellectual training ground to try to like help change the way humanity thinks and sees itself to try to recreate our society, which is kind of like aligned with my personal mission, you know, of Me too. Me what too. I want to do. do something. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, you know, I guess it just means we're trying to create on Earth the most perfect society and it might be maybe we can create something here that all aliens in the universe will be like that's one of the best places to live it's like structured in the most fair elegant way and i would say that we are being guided in that direction uh with with higher um non-human intelligence they're willing to to guide us in that direction if we can open up to it right now so many people are so entrenched in anxiety and fear so obviously this is where meditation comes in because when you can calm the mind and you know be present and open to anything basically it's involving more and more just plain old letting go of fear of death because we're coming down to the bottom line where everybody's getting so anxious and so fearful and we have to let that go. We just got to let it go of everything, let it all go. And from that point, we, we can find motivation to, to move in the right direction with this inner guidance that's coming through for anybody who has a quiet mind. Yeah. It's like this, uh, as we started out the show, uh, nothing in the world, um, what does it go? Oh, it says, uh, nothing is worse than to have a running leakage of spirit conscious <laughs> because that we're just looking in the wrong direction when we do that. So if we can turn inward and become silent, we can find more um, guidance and direction from a yeah. peaceful mind. Love it. Yeah, it's important. Do we have Both? time for a short five minute? Meditation? Absolutely. Let's go ahead and do that. So this whole thing is about releasing fear, releasing anxiety, releasing all that stress and worry and all the buzz of thoughts that go swirling through our minds. So let's, for right now, listen to the bell. You can feel the vibration on your eardrum. Now let's bring our attention to the weight of our body pressing against the cushion or the chair, floor. That sense of 
pressure. Feeling your feet on the floor. Feeling your hands in your lap. Feeling your head balancing on your neck. The muscles tightening and contracting. We'll begin to feel our body expanding and contracting with each breath. When our mind comes into the present moment of what's actually happening through our senses, the mind begins to calm down. Things begin to open up, relax, Feel that breath breathing in and breathing out. When our mind becomes too agitated, we begin to shut down and become more reactive. When our mind is calm and open, expanded, there's more choice. We can respond rather than react. Most Eastern teachers will tell you when your mind is at rest, everything that happens is perfect. It just unfolds naturally. A squirrel doesn't have to go to school to figure out how to survive a winter. It just knows. It's being guided. Just like our body knows that it has to breathe. Just like our liver knows that it has to do thousands of enzymatic exchanges every second. Our stomach knows how to digest and assimilate nutrients. We don't really know how to do any of this. Who's running the show? We're just watching. So when your mind feels chaotic and pressured and stressed, squeezed with fear. Just come back to the breath. Feel your feet on the floor, or better yet, feel your feet in the grass.
we don't have to know. And we can just relish the mystery with curiosity. And from this place of open, soft being, we can be more receptive to higher guidance. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. You too.